I heard the story of two old friends. Both were baseball fanatics, and they made a deal. They promised that the, the one who would die first would come back and tell the other if there is baseball in heaven or not. So sure enough, one died. And he came back a little later and he told his friend, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Which one do you want first? And he said, give me the good news. And the guy said, yes, there is baseball in heaven. And he said, what's the bad news? Well, the bad news, you're scheduled to bat tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Something's wrong with the sound here. Yeah. So likewise, the Bible also has some good news and some bad news. Which one do you want first? The good news is that Jesus is coming soon. The bad news is that he will send to hell those who have continually refused him, continually refused to accept him as their Lord and Savior. One of the most important revelation of the book of Revelation is the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. For some people, it is good news. They rejoice just thinking about it. But for others, it is bad news because they will grieve. This morning in our text, we are going to see one future event that is quickly approaching that will produce different reactions from different people. It is good news for some people. It is bad news for other people. Some will rejoice. Others will mourn. The same event will cause either joy or grief. So please turn with me to our text, book uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, as we continue where we stopped last week. We saw the chapter of three parts, Jesus that John knew, Jesus that John heard, and Jesus that John saw. Today we'll conclude the first part and take the second part. In his introduction of the book of Revelation, John encouraged the hearers and the readers of this book to keep what is in it because a blessing is promised and because the time is near. Jesus is coming soon. The dominant theme of the book of Revelation is the return of Jesus Christ. But his return is in two steps. Step number one, he will come in the clouds. He will gather his people and he will take them to heaven. The rapture of the church takes place before Revelation chapter 5 verse 8 because when we get there in verse 9, we see the church singing their song in heaven. Step two is after the great tribulation. Jesus comes again to defeat all evil and to establish his reign. That's when he will judge the living and the dead. Revelation is definitely a book of good news. The victory of the overcomers but it is also a book of bad news and misery for the rejectors, those who refuse to repent, refuse to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. What terrible things lie ahead for some people. What dreadful things unfold in this book as page succeeds page. John saw it all, the apostasy of the church, the breakdown of law and order, not the TV show, the crash of the establishment, the growing horror of wars and woes, 
the dreadful bloodbath of persecution, the cruel reign of the beast, and how he will torment the people on earth. But what wonderful things lie ahead for other people as they finally get to see the Lord whom they have been waiting for for so long and the thought of remaining with him forevermore. Good news for some, bad news for others. Joy for some, grief for others. What will it be for you? Joy or grief? John continues the book. He says, verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. The word behold is a command. It's a command to look, to check it out. Jesus also said that we should watch and wait for his coming in Matthew 24. It is something to keep in the forefront of our mind at all times. We cannot forget that. Jesus is coming for us soon. This week, Jesus came for the son of my friend, a retired police officer. His son was only 35 years old. In one instant, he fell down. He was dead. He was in the presence of Jesus. Jesus came for him. This can happen to any one of us here. Jesus is coming soon for the whole bunch or for one by one. What John is describing here in verse 7 is the second step of the coming of Jesus Christ, not the first step. This will be explained later in great detail when we get to chapter 19. This is not a description of the rapture of the church. When he comes in the cloud, not with the cloud, nor on the clouds. He takes to take away his people, as it is explained in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. When he comes to rapture his people, he will come as a thief in the night. And only those who are going to be with him will see him, because he's not coming down to the earth. He is in the cloud. Only those going will see him. The event described here would be witnessed by the whole world, especially by the nation of Israel. So John mentioned four details about the second coming here. Detail number one, Jesus is coming with clouds. The Greek verb expresses a motion from one place to another. The Bible says that Jesus is with the Father right now, making intercession for us. This verse indicates that Jesus will again leave the place where he is now and will come back with clouds. Now, some people teach that the clouds there are the thousands of saints in their white robes coming back with the Lord. It could be, but the same word used in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, for the ascension of Jesus is used here. In Acts 1, 9, as the disciples watched, Jesus was taken up, and a cloud, that same word, received them out of their sight. It was not a cloud of thousands of saints. It was an actual cloud. Jesus in Matthew 25 talked about his coming on the cloud of heaven. He said, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened 
and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The book of Revelation let us know three things. The event that will precede his coming with clouds. Number two, the event that will take place at the time of his coming. And then number three, the events that will take place after he has come. We see all this in the book of Revelation. The book is about the future. That is why it is so fascinating. It is full of information about the future. Detail number two, he says, every eye will see Jesus. It is not going to be a secret thing. There will be no doubt in anyone's mind. No one will be wondering, did he come yet? Is he here? Did I miss anything? Every eye will see him. Some people say he has already come, and he is in a secret chamber. It cannot be. Every eye will see him when he comes. Not only a selected few, not only the very spiritual people, every eye will see him. The whole world is going to know when he returns. It won't be a secret thing. Then we have detail number three. Also, those who pierced him. David, when he wrote Psalm 22, described the crucifixion <clears throat> as if he was right there. And yet it happened 1,000 years later. And he said in verse 16, they pierced my hands and my feet. Even though the actual executioners and rejectors of Jesus, those who actually pierced him, are now dead and will not resurrect until after the millennium, the godly remnant of Israel will look on him. This godly remnant will represent the nation of Israel. Zacharias, who prophesied of the second coming of Jesus, said in chapter 12, verse 10, Then they will look on me, whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourned for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieved for a firstborn. The first time that Jesus came to earth, he was rejected. He was mocked. He was crucified. He came to die for our sin. But when he comes again, he is going to come with power and great glory, with authority to take over the leadership of this world. He is going to set up a kingdom of peace and righteousness on earth. And us, who have been raptured seven years earlier, will be with him when he comes back to establish his kingdom. We will live and reign with him right here on this planet for 1,000 years. After the millennium is over, we will still be with him forever and ever in the new heaven and the new earth that he is going to create. That's the good news. Then we have detail number four. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. The Greek word for tribes is races. All the different races of earth will be weeping. Not only the Jews. This is not a reference to the 12 tribes of Israel, but all the races of earth. 
When Jesus comes, not only the Jewish people will mourn because of the rejection of Jesus, but all the races of the earth will mourn because of him. The day is coming when those who disregarded, those who opposed and rejected Jesus will realize and discover that he is indeed the Lord of the universe. He is the judge of their soul, and they will mourn. Why will they mourn? John says in verse 7 here, because of him. They will re realize how foolish they have been to reject him. Their eyes will be opened. They will see Jesus. They will see that he is indeed the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He is not here to suffer again. His suffering and mocking days are over. They will mourn greatly as they realize that they were wrong. And they will be terribly afraid. That's the bad news. Believers will not mourn his coming. On the contrary, they say, even so, amen. To them, it is not bad news. It is exciting news. The word amen means, let it be as you say, Lord. Let Jesus come with cloud. Hurry up, Lord. So the main two characteristics of the Lord's second coming, number one, it will be visible. It is not going to be a secret thing. Every eye will see him. And number two, it will be victorious, visible and victorious. All the races of the earth will mourn because of him. John goes on, he says in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. There is a change of speaker in the middle of the verse. And there is a change of color of ink. Here John quotes the Lord as making a statement about himself. Earlier, John started telling us about who he is. And he said that he is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn of the dead. He is the ruler of king. Here Jesus add four more things about who he is. Number one, he is the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Saying that he is the A to Z. He is everything. He is the totality. The Bible says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. It is he who began and it is he who will end God's program in the world. His name means the becoming one. He is from eternity to eternity. This mode of speech is borrowed from the Hebrew language. They use alert and tau, the first and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, to express the whole of a matter. We see it in Psalm 119. The first section, first letter is alet, and then the last one is tau, T-A-U. First thing that he says about him, the alpha, the omega. Second thing he says, the beginning, in the end, some older Greek manuscript do not have this second statement about Jesus. It seems to be a repetition of Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. It appears to be a descriptive note in the margin that was also translated. 
but still he is the totality. Number three, who is, who was, who is to come. The eternal one. He has always existed. Do not get confused by the previous statement. He is the beginning for us, but he has no beginning. He has always been. It is very hard for us to understand this with our finite mind. God is infinite. He was before time began. He is now, and he will be after the end. He lives outside of time. And then number four, he says, the almighty, the all-ruling, absolute, universal, sovereign, the omnipotent. The Greek word appears seven times in the Old Testament. No, in the New Testament. There's no Greek in the Old Testament. Once in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and then all six times in the book of Revelation. If we are in the hands of a God like that, almighty, all power, there is nothing for us to worry about. In his prophecy concerning the Messiah, Isaiah mentioned in Isaiah 9, 6, that Jesus is the Almighty. Hitler vowed that his Third Reich would last for 1,000 years. It started on January 30th, 1933, and lasted a total of 148 months a few months over 12 years. By 1945, it was all over for him. He committed suicide. He could still be alive today, but no. Jesus will set up a kingdom that will actually last for 1,000 years. Then when the millennium has run its course, his kingdom will be replaced with another one, an everlasting kingdom never to pass away. At verse 9, we have the second part, Jesus that John heard. And John continues, and he says in verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. We are given a lot of information here. Who, where, why, when, what. All these questions are answered right here. First. The who. Who is John? But well, John says four things about himself. Number one, he says, I am your brother. At that time, 96-year-old John was the greatest man on earth. He had been very close to Jesus. He had eaten with him. He had reclined on his bosom. And still, he did not put himself on a pedestal, or exalt himself above the others. You've not seen Jesus. I've been with him. You never ate with him. I reclined on him. No, he was a humble man. He simply refers to himself as our brother, not bishop, not monsignor. That's the way God intended it to be. No spiritual hierarchy. All brothers and sisters, that's the way we are to look at each other. God has no favorites. 
He has no special ones whom he loves more than the others. He is no respecter of person. It is how in, 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 incredible to me how people like titles, distinction, special recognition. How quickly they forget the words of Jesus. If you want to be the greatest, learn to be the servant of all. John knew that. We might all have different calling, be in different ministries, having different responsibilities or different authorities. Still, we all have the same background. We are all sinners saved by grace. We all have the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second thing he says, I am your companion in tribulation. This is not to be confused with the great tribulation. It is not the same thing. John did not go to the great tribulation. We will not go to the great tribulation. The Greek word is plural. The tribulations that we face that come from the devil who hates us. The great tribulation, singular, come from God. God's judgment upon the earth. Coming from God, it then excludes the child of God from being part of it. Why? Because Christ died and paid for the sins, the trespasses of the child of God. God has not appointed his own children to go to the great tribulation. He did not allow them to go through the great tribulation if he did allow them to go to the great tribulation, it would mean then that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was not enough. It was not sufficient to pay for our sin. We have to go through another section to pay for our sin. Not so. The judgment is coming for the rebellious sinners. Jesus died for John, and yet he had trials and persecution and tribulation. He was not exempt from that, and neither are we. We are just exempt from the great tribulation. He's a companion in tribulation. He's going to face the same thing we face. He's not talking about the great tribulation of the last days. The Bible promised in 2 Timothy 3.12, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. They will go through it. But with the knowledge that it is working for their own good, they have Romans 8, 28 to encourage them. That's why God allows it to happen. Jesus said that serving him won't be easy. It's not going to be a cakewalk. That's only on harvest night. But he promised that we can do all things through him. And then number three, he says, I'm your companion in the kingdom. Not only do we have the same background, the same Lord, same Savior, we also have the same destiny. We are all bound for the same place. Our destiny is eternal life in the kingdom of God. So we will be companion with this guy, John, in heaven. Then number four, he says, your companion in patience. What does he mean? He means waiting for that kingdom. This is a hard thing to do, to be patient, to wait for God's timing. The world around us is so corrupted that we would like to see God get on with it. John was patient. He waited for the Lord to be done with him. And so must we. We need to remember that God is not willing that any shall perish. So we need to be patient. We must remember that like John, all of us are companions in these three ways. We are companions in tribulations. Life is hard for all of us. Temptations are everywhere. The devil is after all of us. 
tra tragedies happen to all of us. We also are, have our companion in the kingdom. All of us are trying to make it into the kingdom of God. We have the same goal. We are going to the same place. And also, we are companion in patient. It is hard for all of us to wait, but we must be patient. Knowing this should help us to understand each other, should help us to be compassionate with one another, forgiving each other, encouraging one another, helping one another, because we are all in the same boat. We are all companions in the same things. Notice that we have three things in common, all of us. We have a common royalty. We are all companions in the kingdom of God. We have a common royalty. We are on the same road. All companions in tribulations, the road is rough. And we have a common requirement. All companions impatient, all of us must wait. So after the who, we have the where. We have the exact location of the message in verse 9. The island of Patmos, a rocky volcanic island about 24 miles west of the coast of Asia Minor, now Turkey, the Turkey coast. It's a small island about 10 miles long, 6 miles wide, 40 miles south west of Ephesus. Bible commentator Albert Barnes described this path moss as being lonely, desolate, barren, uninhabited, and seldom visited. It had all the prerequisite desired to be a place of punishment. John was exiled there about 90 AD, probably by the Roman emperor Domitian, the brother of Titus who destroyed the city of Jerusalem. He was exiled there because of his testimony of Jesus Christ. According to church history, one historian named Eusebius wrote about how each of the apostles were martyred for their faith. An incredible thing to read. He mentioned that J James, the brother of the Lord, was beheaded first. He was the first one. And then Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was also beheaded in Rome. All met violent death, except John. This old guy, John, did not die when they placed him in boiling oil. So he was sent to that island, Patmos, to go and die there. And apparently, he did not even die there. He died in Ephesus a few years after he had finished writing this book of Revelation. When another emperor came, Nerva, he got into power and he let this old man go. The Lord was not true with this old man. As long as God is not true with you, nothing can happen to you. And the Lord had one more thing for John to do. He was going to use him to write this book, and he was to send him to that island for that. The people sent him there thinking they'll never see, they, they will never hear from that old man again. But he wrote this book and sent the letters to many different churches. Then we have the why. It simply says, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is not clear what John is trying to say here. Either he was on Patmos because of his loyalty to the word of God and his testimony of Jesus Christ, what he had said about the word of God and about Jesus Christ, past tense, 
or he was on Patmos for writing the Word of God and be a testimony for Jesus Christ, future tense. Either one is acceptable. In verse 10, we have the last two, the what and the when. First, the what. What happened? John was in the Spirit, and he heard behind him a loud voice as of a trumpet. He did not hear a trumpet. The voice did not sound like a trumpet. People read this, and they make up things. It was as loud, it was as powerful as a trumpet. It gets the people's attention like a trumpet does. It was Jesus speaking. As far as we know, the apostle John had not heard the Lord's voice since he had returned to heaven that over 60 years earlier. Later in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, John will hear again that trumpet-like voice calling him to heaven. There are actually four references to John being in the Spirit in the book of Revelation. He was in the Spirit at Patmos, Revelation 1.10. In heaven, Revelation 4.2. In the wilderness, Revelation 17.3. And on the mountain of God, Revelation 21.10. Finally, we have the when. The time of the message is a little more complex. There are two views concerning John's statement in verse 10. View number one says that it was on the Lord's day, on a Sunday, the first day of the week. View number two says John was actually transported to the very day of the Lord, the Lord's day, where he saw all the judgment, the battles, as though he were right there. The spirit world is timeless. It was either on the first day of the week or on the actual day of the Lord. You can pick whichever you want. It makes no difference. It's not important. But it was not on the Sabbath day. Most commentators tend to lean towards Sunday, the first day of the week. In the past, God had showed his prophet many future things without actually taking them to the actual location. Notice the two locations where John was. Number one, he was on the island of Patmos. Verse 9. And number 2, he was in the Spirit. Verse 10. Every Christian lives in two locations. A physical location here on earth and a spiritual location either in the Spirit or in the flesh. The spiritual location is more important. We can tolerate any difficult situation when we are in the Spirit. You should not be interested to live in the flesh. It is a miserable place to be. A Christian was once asked if he was going to heaven, and he replied, I live there. Funny, he had a little shoe repair shop in an apartment upstairs over his shop. When asked about his situation, he said, I work down here, but I live up there. Likewise, John had learned the secret of a life in the Spirit. He was living in the Spirit, living a life of worship, a beautiful way to live. Next, we have the sound of the message, a voice like a trumpet blast. In the next few chapters, John will quote what the Lord told him to write, and it will be all in red ink. The first part of verse 11 is not found in some older Greek manuscript. It starts with what you see right. 
Some say this duplication of verse 8 was added by a translator as an explanation to clarify who said this. Either way, John received two clear instructions in verse 11. Number one, write in a book. What he was about to hear was not confidential. John was to make all the information available to the people. Revelation is not a sealed book. And number two, instruction number two, send the book. To write in a book and send the book. Daniel was told the opposite, to close up, to seal the book for the end time. John, on the contrary, was to send it out to the churches. This is the first of 12 commands in the book of Revelation for John to write what he saw. Each command is related to a preceding vision. He will see a vision, and then he was told to write it. Only one vision was not to be recorded. Which one? The one in chapter 10, verse 4, where the seven thunders spoke. They said something, and John was not to write what they said. This is the only part of the book that is secret. Then he was given the exact place where to send this book. We have the names of the seven churches. There were more than seven churches in this area, but Christ selected these specific churches to represent the spiritual needs of his people. We will see how Incredible, those seven are selected and how we can relate to each one. And they describe the church history from the apostle to the church that exists in the end time. Interesting, the apostle Paul also wrote to seven churches. Rome, Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Colossae, Philippians, Thessalonians. Only Ephesus is in both lists. We will study each and every church as we continue our study. So the world where we live is a lost world. We are riding on a sick, fallen planet. It is just a matter of time for God to destroy it. That means that each and every one of us on the planet has to go somewhere else. And there are only two places for us to go from here. There's a great place, heaven, and there's a horrible, awful place, hell. Indeed, the Bible has some good news and some bad news. Jesus Christ is coming back the same way you went up, with the cloud. It is good news to us. Is it bad news to you? Is it good news to you? If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're walking with him, you're abiding in his word, to you it is good news. But if you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not walking with the Lord. You're not abiding in his word. I'm afraid to say it is bad news for you. Soon Jesus will be coming. Make sure that it is good news to you. Make the necessary arrangement, the necessary changes in order for you to be ready for him. His return will produce one of two things, joy or grief. <clears throat> God has some good news and some bad news. We see in our text, there's good news for some and bad news for others. I'll go one step further and I will tell you that it is possible to tell who believes as good news and who believes as bad news. Just watch them live. Those who know they have good news, God has good news for them. They have that joy that the other one does not have. They live in the spirit. They have a different, different 
attitude of different life than the one who seemed to be expecting bad news. He's playing with sin, in and out of sin, not really living in the spirit, but living in the flesh. And it's not, it's a miserable place to live. It's not a good place to live. So you can tell by the way the person is, if I'm expecting good news, the whole world knows it. They, you can be two minutes with me, you know I'm expecting good news. I'm waiting for the Lord. I'm excited to see him. And that should be the attitude of all those Christians. God has good news for you. All of that stuff that we're going to read about the misery of the people and the scorching of the sun and all the boils. And what happened to us? This is not for us. So just the fact that we bypass all of these things in the book of Revelation is good news. And we should live accordingly. Men, God has saved me. I am saved. I'm the child of God. And I rejoice. So may the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. May you fill your heart with joy today. And may you live in the spirit, whatever you are. Physically, may you live in the spirit at all times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.